Honorable Minister, Honorable State Minister, the Secretary and State Secretary to the Ministry of Plantation Industries, the uh, Chairman and Director of NIPM, uh, senior officials, uh, senior managers uh, of the plantation companies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first uh, thank NIPM for inviting me to be here on this very auspicious day for the Institute as well as its students. Um, I think probably this day is all about those who are receiving certificates and diplomas today. And they are, of course, joining a very proud group, a proud part of our community, a, communi a community which has had an extremely proud history over the last 150 or more years. The planters of Sri Lanka have played an extraordinarily important role in the history of our country. What many people don't recognize or have forgotten is that our highly acclaimed social development is due to the taxes that were levied on the plantation sector, and it was those taxes that financed our free education, our free, free health, our rice ration. A very large proportion of the government's revenue uh, in the first 20, 30 years after independence came from taxes on the plantation sector. So it was the work of those planters which generated the surpluses, which provided the taxes, which enabled us to build the free education, free health, and the social welfare threshold, which is admired around the world. So thank you to that community, and we must wish the young planters who are joining that very proud band of people the very best uh, in the years to come. Now, um, the, uh, when I was, in, was in, um, introduced, it was said that uh, uh, the central bank is responsible for helping to manage the economy. And in these days, I thought, before I get on to the main part of my, my remarks, that I should just say a few words about the state of the economy. Because there's a great deal of uncertainty and even apprehension in the country about what has been happening in recent weeks. The headline message to deliver from the central bank's perspective is that while the recent events were not at all helpful, that the situation can definitely be managed. If you look at what has happened uh, after the heinous bombings, uh, as well as the disturbances that took place a few weeks after that, uh, there are going to be significant impacts. The most impacted industry is the tourism sector, which has taken a major hit. There, the government has taken certain um, relief measures. The central bank has arranged for a moratorium of their loans, both capital and interest, and other, other support as well. So hopefully the tourism sector, if stability is maintained, will recover uh, relatively quickly. Um, in addition, the government's revenue is likely to be take, take a hit. Uh, the expenditure, there will be additional expenditure. Uh, in addition, the growth rate, the central bank was predicting uh, a growth rate of 4% for this year. I suspect now it's more likely to be 3%. So these are all, all effects, and clearly uh, there is no doubt uh, that the events uh, of recent times, as I said, have not been at all helpful. But the upside narrative is that the productive capacity of the economy remains largely untouched. Agriculture was not affected. Uh, I'm aware of one, I think, pasta factory which was affected. Outside that, the industrial, the manufacturing installations have not been affected. Some retail outlets have been affected uh, in the Northwest province. But by and large, the other areas, they were not directly affected. Of course, for two, three weeks, there was a significant slowdown in the economy because people were concerned about their personal safety. But now I think since the Vesak weekend, a great deal of normalcy has returned. The security forces have done an excellent job in normalizing the situation. And one senses that we are now pretty much back to normal. So as I said, with the productive capacity largely intact, 
there is no reason why outside the tourism sector and the various supply chains associated with it that we should not get back to a high degree of normalcy. And if you look at the macroeconomic variables which the central bank is most concerned with, we are confident that inflation will continue to remain within our target range of 4 to 6%. It has gone up a little. It's the, the headline inflation rate is about 5.2%, but our target is 4 to 6%, so we're, we're well within that target. If you look at the, the interest rates, after these events, there, were, there have been six treasury bill auctions. On each occasion, the yields have come down. We had the largest ever bond issuance of 120 billion uh, rupees about three weeks ago. There again, the yield came down. If you look at our international sovereign bonds, we issued two bonds in March. They're uh, worth 2.4 billion US dollars. If you look at the yields there, they're no higher than the price we paid in March. On top of that, the executive board of the IMF uh, passed the fifth review of the facility we have with them, the extended fund facility, on the 13th of March, 13th of May, rather. That would not have happened if the underlying fundamentals of the economy were not basically sound. So the fundamentals are basically sound. As I said, there will be a hit, but it is manageable. And in terms of whether we can repay our debt, certainly we have already paid 65% of our obligations this year, the foreign debt obligations. And we are going to the market again in the coming weeks to raise some more money. And our bankers have said there is still appetite for Sri Lankan bond issuances. So that is not a problem. Uh, we feel we can manage the situation. In our view, the worst possible scenario means that the balance of payments, the reserves of the country, will take a hit of somewhere between 1.5 and 2 billion US dollars. Now, our projections for the reserves of the country for this year was 8.2 billion. So let us say we have a $2 billion hit, which is the very outside. Uh, then our reserves would be 6.2 billion, which is an adequate level. It's not an excellent level of reserves, but it gives us about three months import cover, which is adequate. But for that, we need to be able to go and raise about 2 billion US dollars more which we plan to do in the coming weeks. So as I said, the situation is, uh, I, I don't want to downplay uh, the negative effects of what has happened. Clearly, lots of lives have been very, very severely affected. But overall, the situation is manageable. And it's now up to us as Sri Lankans to have enough confidence in the economy to let it do its work because it can. The economy is intact, and it can take us back to where we were on the 18th of April. Now, let me now uh, turn to the uh, matters at hand today. You know, uh, the agricultural sector, though it now accounts for only 7% of GDP, uh, provides livelihoods for 25% of the workforce. That's roughly about 2 million people. And that's, if you count the families, if you take an average family size of four, eight million people in this country are dependent on income streams generated by agriculture. Uh, and in addition to that, though one says that agriculture only accounts for 7% of GDP, if you take into account all the backward and forward linkages which flow out of the agriculture sector, all in all about 20% of GDP is in one way or the other linked to the agricultural sector. And within the agricultural sector now, for uh, over 150 years, the plantation sector has had uh, pride of place. Uh, of course, the paddy sector, it has its importance uh, in terms of uh, the social fabric of this country. But in terms of the employment, foreign exchange, etc., the plantation sector has played a very important role uh, for many, many years now. Um, now, the, um, what is disappointing, of course, is that back in 1970, uh, tea, rubber, and coconut accounted for around 12% of GDP. Uh, they're now down to 1.5%. So this is clearly a, a, a trend uh, that 
uh, is not entirely uh, positive. But having said that, the plantation crops still remain an extremely important part of our economy. Uh, tea exports last year accounted, uh, amounted to just below US dollars 505, 1.5 rather, US dollars 1.5 billion, which is roughly about 12% of our total exports. Rubber account, uh, accounted for US dollars 900 million, which is about 7.7% of our exports, and coconut accounted for 311 million US dollars, which is about 2%, uh, and of course spices again accounted for uh, about five or 600 million on top of that. So the, the plantation sector uh, clearly has an important role to play, particularly in terms of our export earnings. And given the debt dynamics, given the external debt burden that we have, it is critical that we have export expansion to get out of this problem. That is really at the heart of it. At the moment, we are kind of borrowing to buy time to keep things going. We'll only get out of the problem if we have export transformation. And the plantation sector plays an important role. Now, the, um, but the positive aspect uh, in terms of uh, the plantation sector is that if you look at particularly the tea sector uh, and the global trends, clearly there are very positive uh, developments. Um, the European Union, which was the largest importer uh, in 2016, accounted for about 18% of global tea shipments, which amounted to 1.84 million tons in 2016. And the Russian Federation, Pakistan, the US, Egypt, are other, uh, the UAE, are other big uh, importers. And we have a presence in a number of those markets. I'll say more about that later. Uh, but so there is really uh, clearly uh, prospects for expanding exports. The market seems to be expanding, but we need to not only capture the incremental uh, uh, growth in that market, but also to increase our, our market share. Now, let me, and simulate coconut, there are some positive trends I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, rubber has more uh, difficult challenges. Um, let me now talk about some issues uh, in the plantation sector, and then suggest some ways forward. Clearly, in the central bank, we're not expert uh, planters, so these are uh, thoughts we are sharing with you uh, from a position of some ignorance. Uh, but anyway, uh, let me, uh, let me uh, 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 share these thoughts with you and hopefully, hopefully uh, they are constructive. Now, what are some of the challenges? One clearly is productivity. The plantation sector suffers from a lack of competitiveness with low productive levels. Low labor productivity is a major issue faced by the sector. However, there are a number of contributory factors which lead to the uh, lack of competitiveness and productivity. Among these are poor adoption of the required agro-management, um, including replanting, low market prices, inadequate water supply, adverse weather conditions, decreasing fi for fert uh, soil fertility, and lack of better crop varieties and pest damage. So these are the range of issues that are contributing to a, a, a low productivity. Secondly, uh, another challenge is the cost of production. Productivity and cost of production are interrelated. The high cost of production makes the industry non-competitive. This lowers profitability. New investment is therefore important to replace old seedling stocks with high-yielding tea plants which produce high-quality tea at a lower cost. Further, around 40% from the cost of production is spent on labor charges. Now here, I think we need to ask ourselves some honest and searching questions. What is really the problem? Are labor costs too high? Or have we not had the level of investment and technological improvement which enables the industry to 
pay a decent wage. I suspect it's a bit of both. And in, in, in looking at this issue, it's important to take cognizance of the fact that the price of a kilo of tea, which ultimately determines the prospects of both the plantation companies, the, plant, the, the owners, as well as the workers. Both their prospects are ultimately determined by the cost of a kilo of tea. So both sides, particularly the labor side, needs to keep in mind that that is the key parameter in determining what is legitimately possible and still to have a viable uh, sector. Equally, I think, the companies and the owners need to think carefully whether their investment policy is constructive in terms of strengthening the prospects of the sector in the medium to long term. I remember many years ago when I was working in the central bank, I was uh, seconded to the Ministry of Finance and, and I was uh, the then finance minister, Mr. Ronnie Demel's bag carrier. So wherever he went, I went with him. And once we went to, to Kenya and we went to Kericho. And of course, they're very lucky because they have altitude on, on, a, on a flat plateau. So the topography is more friendly. Uh, but there we discovered that the T Smallholders Development Authority had played a major, major role in driving research, in promoting new technology. Of course, they're easier, easier. As I said, it's a flat land, so that uh, topography is easier. But the uh, TDSA, um, uh, rather the TSDA in Kenya, has played an important role and I think is a useful model uh, for us to study. Um, now, the, you know, and I think we have challenges, A, the topography, uh, B, our aging fields, which makes replanting more important, uh, C, a lack of technological progress. I know that te te technological progress is difficult given our landscape, but I think we, these are all difficult questions which we need to come to grips with uh, if we are to improve uh, the productivity uh, so that we are able to maintain a cost of production which gives sufficient profitability to the investor as well as a decent wage for labor. Now, the labor shortages. Um, in the earlier times, labor was confined within plantations, thus creating residential labor, which was very much dependent on the management for all aspects of their life. Today, outflows of labor from the plantation sector to other sectors in search of employment has become an increasing trend. The younger generation is less inclined to continue to work and live in the plantations and expects a career which would give them greater access to modern amenities. So while the demand for labor uh, continues to be high, uh, there are serious challenges on the supply side and those need to be addressed carefully. Um, now, already I think successive governments have done a great deal from the Honorable Minister's father's time, as the State Minister said, a great deal has been done to improve the living standards of the plantation workers. But I think that is a journey that needs to continue uh, to, if we are to retain workers in the plantation sector. And there is a shortage of skilled labor in the plantation industry, and this is a key challenge. And here, uh, the NIPM clearly has a very important role and is playing an important role to identify the skill shortages and to align its programs to suit the needs of the sector. Now, the other factor I'd like to uh, raise as a, as a challenge uh, is climate change. Uh, Sri Lankan agriculture has already felt the effect of extreme weather events, which are increasing both in frequency and intensity. There has been a slow but steady rise of the ambient temperature at the rate of 0.01 to 0.03 centigrade per year. The plantation sector is the most vulnerable 
to climate change. And a comprehensive study uh, of climate transition is critical for formulating effective adaptation strategies. Th this is really very critical. Sri the World Bank has identified Sri Lanka as one of the, I think, 40 odd most vulnerable countries to climate change. And within that, the plantation sector is extremely vulnerable. So I think a lot of work needs to be done proactively to formulate uh, strategies, adaptation strategies, uh, which can cope with this climate transition. Um, extreme weather conditions, such as strong winds in the hill country, result in disturbances to the growth of tea leaves. High intensity rainfall results, results in a loss of tapping days for rubber. Landslides, soil, and coastal erosion affect other plantations while floods and earth slips cause damage to plant nurseries and affect the access, to, and affect the access roads of plantation factories and lands. Next, let me um, turn in terms of challenges to fluctuating market prices. Uh, as I said, the world market price, which is beyond our control, is a critical determinant of the prospects of the economy. And the fact that that tends to fluctuate clearly makes decision-making, particularly for smallholders, are very challenging. The fifth uh, challenge relates to a lack of export market diversification. Approximately 51% of Ceylon tea is exported to five countries, Iraq, Russia, Iran, Turkey, and Libya. However, each of these five countries have volatile markets which are frequently affected by political uncertainty, are subject to international sanctions, record slow or negative economic growth, experience currency fluctuations, and are impacted by high inflation, which affects their purchasing power of their people. Further, these top five buyers depend heavily on income from oil. The volatility of oil prices, therefore, is passed through to the operations of the tea sector, thereby adding another layer of uncertainty. High tariffs in Turkey, Russia, and Iran also affect Sri Lanka's tea exports, especially value-added exports. The over-reliance on these five volatile markets has a significant impact on the auction price, as disruption, even in one market, tends to have serious ramification on Colombo tea auction prices. One such example, almost emblematic of the uncertainty and the problems uh, in these markets, is the difficulties in payments from Iran. Uh, the, uh, the sanctions, particularly the US sanctions, the financial sanctions, have made it extremely difficult for us to have payment for uh, our tea exports through normal channels. In fact, the Honorable Minister has worked extremely hard, uh, and we are trying various ways and means. We've had diplomatic demarches, etc. But the problem is, even if we've, we actually got the American ambassador to come to the central bank and to explain to the banks how you can do transactions without touching, uh, without violating the sanctions. But the banks are very nervous. Because the banks, I think, on a quarterly or half yearly basis, ha get a due diligence uh, um, form from their US correspondence banks. And the US banking system dominates the world banking system. They get the due diligence uh, disclosure requirements on a regular basis from the American ba uh, banks, which ask the question, do you have dealings with Iran? And if you say yes, <laughs> you have no chance to, to explain. Uh, because our business for these big American banks is negligible. So they don't want to incur the administration costs of doing the due diligence to work out whether we are actually following the, the sanction requirements. So in the end, our banks, even our state banks, are very, very nervous about doing any business that channels financing to or from Iran. So this is a cha challenge. We are, Minister has suggested a barter system. And I think we're having a meeting next week uh, at the foreign ministry uh, with, uh, under the minister's uh, uh, leadership, which we hope we'll be able to work out some form of barter system. So that's really emblematic of the kind of challenges these markets, which are our key markets, uh, have inbuilt into them. Uh, so one possible thing is to think whether we diversify our markets even more uh, out of that region, uh, if at all possible. Okay, on the way forward, what are some of the issues? 
clearly macroeconomic stability, if we have low inflation, predictable interest rates, and a competitive exchange rate, all sectors of the economy, during the including the plantation sector, will benefit. Historically, we have had an overvalued exchange rate, which effectively subsidized foreign producers at the expense of our own producers. Of course, you know, our, our politicians are not stupid. They, don't, they didn't push for an overvalued exchange rate to subsidize foreign, foreign uh, producers. But what an over, over, overvalued exchange rate does is all, it also subsidizes consumers at the expense of producers. But clearly, unless you produce, you can't generate the income to consume. Historically, we have always protected the consumer at the expense of the producer, or the foreign producer at the expense of our local producer. Now, a policy that the central bank is currently adopting is to have a competitive exchange rate. Last year, of course, due to domestic and external pressures, the exchange rate depreciated by 16%. And I'm sure the plantation companies, uh, were, <laughs> their bottom line would have benefited greatly uh, from the movement in the exchange rate. So providing a competitive exchange rate, but also making sure that it's stable through other measures is critical for the, uh, for the plantation sector. Um, and in order to achieve this stable macroeconomic conditions, um, the government is in the process of formulating four frameworks. One is a flexible inflation targeting framework that the central bank is already implementing. We are having a forward-looking, proactive monetary policy, which, is, which has as its sole goal maintaining interest rates within the 4 to 6% target. So that will be the sole goal of the, the monetary policy in this country, to keep inflation within 4 to 6%. The Monetary Law Act, which has been in existence in 1950, is being replaced by a new act, which has been passed by cabinet, which is with the legal draftsman, which hopefully will go to parliament within the next couple of months. And that is revolutionary in the sense that in future, the central bank will not be allowed to print money to finance the government deficit because it is extremely damaging. It is something that has happened over and over again. It causes inflation. It causes pressure on the balance of payments. In future, the government will have to manage on its own. The central bank will not have uh, what we call uh, fiscal forbearance. That is, it won't just print money and give it to the government because it's extraordinarily damaging. It has been very damaging over the years, but now, by provided parliament parts it, passes it, by law, the central bank will not be permitted to do it, which is a major advance if we can get it through in terms of having stable macroeconomic conditions. Because otherwise, for the last 40, 50 years, every time the government was short of money, rather than exercising discipline, it got the central bank to print money. So I think we need to break away from that. Two, um, the second way forward is in terms of productivity, improving efficiency and competitiveness uh, in the plantation industry requires that high costs of production associated with low productivity needs to be reduced. Increased productivity in the short term can be achieved through fertilizing and infilling, while the longer term measures include replanting, new planting, soil conservation, climate smart agriculture practices, and training and skills development. A third way forward is geographical indications to protect Sri Lankan exports in the world. One, the, the non-availability of effective protection for Ceylon tea leads to counterfeits of Ceylon tea brands by foreign traders, while local exporters have inadequate legal resources to address this. Currently, new regulations are being drafted to provide facilities for GI registration in Sri Lanka, which will enhance protection. Registration of GIs will facilitate exporters to penetrate international markets and to prevent malpractices by competitors. And this is going to apply initially both to tea and to cinnamon. So this will enable the country to promote Ceylon branded products in global markets through promotional campaigns. Four, the need to focus on value added products to move from commoditization to premiumization. Uh, new market trends suggest a move by consumers from a range of different beverages to tea. These trends include a surge of new value-added products such as ready-to-drink, fruit, herbal, 
flavored teas, black tea fusions, and an expansion of green tea consumption outside Asia. The drivers behind this trend include a heightened perception of tea as a healthy alternative, as well as the inroads made by tea bags in developing and emerging markets where consumption has traditionally been based on loose leaves. Global revenue on RTDT, RTDT the ready to drink tea and coffee markets, were estimated at approximately US dollars 69 billion in 2011 and are expected to have reached 125 billion US dollars by the end of 2017, growing at an annual rate of 10.9% between 2012 and 2017. So clearly this is a, a wave that we need to serve. The shift towards premium teas is also reflected in the rising market values at the regional level. Europe, the world's most important, important region, import region, saw its overall market value rising by 5.1% per annum between 2011 and 2016, while overall volumes of tea uh, has also increased. And, it, uh, and it, within these trends, there has been a, a move towards uh, quality and, and speciality teas. Rubber, what's interesting is now we, rubber exports uh, total uh, 875 million US dollars. And natu uh, natural rubber accounts for only about 30 million. Uh, actually, I should say total rubber exports is about 900 million. Only about 30 million is natural rubber. So the vast proportion of rubber exports are rubber products, particularly gloves and, and tires. So we've got some niches, but the challenge here, I think, is the price and production. So we need to see whether there is research that can be done to address those issues. Coconut in the form of virgin coconut oil and coconut water has an emerging and expanding market the world over. In tw the 2015 export and import commodity data indicated that there was a growing market for coconut oil in the USA, China, Korea, and the European Union. Coconut water, too, has a global market which is expanding. Global coconut water consumption hit 3.9 billion liters in 2016. The coconut water market in the USA, the UK, and Japan continues to boom as coconut water appeals to demand for wellness products. Market research shows that much higher growth in coconut water consumption is expected from France, China, and Canada. Here again, the challenge is production, as a lot of coconut land has been taken out of production due to population uh, pressure and pressure for commercial uh, usage of the land. So again, the global market is growing. We need to work out how best to take advantage of it. The next uh, uh, way forward point is uh, many crops cultivated in Sri Lanka have considerable potential in various agro industries. However, most of the crops are exported in raw form without any value addition. Promoting investment to high end value added products and development of such products through research and development training are required in this regard. Here, cinnamon is, is a, I think, a very good example. I'm told skin, cinnamon is a key input into perfumes and other fragrances. I mean, that is a multi-billion uh, dollar market. But we export our cinnamon in raw form. We need to get investment into the country from these uh, major players uh, so that we can add value uh, and sell the cinnamon in, in process form because these are very, very high value addition. You know, things like perfumes and other fragrances. Uh, it's a high-end market. And the key raw material is what we have, and we, are a, we produce a very large uh, uh, part of the world's supply, and we're not making good use of it. And we also need to target other growing markets for Sri Lanka's spices, and uh, cinnamon is the biggest example of that. Um, the other uh, thing is to strengthen the value chain, the production value chain and to maintain quality and safety standards. Here, uh, it's important to increase the awareness among growers, traders, and processors about quality requirements of import co importing countries and encourage all stakeholders to put in place quality systems such as GAP, GNP, HAACP, and ISO, ISO 2200 certifications. 
This can be further achieved through backward integration of exporters. This is crucial. If we are going to export value-added products, high-end products, into uh, higher-income uh, markets, then uh, maintaining standards uh, becomes very important. Um, finally, diversifying, sorry, there are a couple more. Diversifying the plantation sector into agro-tourism also could benefit the uh, state sector. I know that has already happened and it adds profit centers in the plantations. It's been done successfully and we need to see whether we can do more. And here there is, I believe, a strong case to have a thorough going review of land use and crop mix in the plantation sector. Uh, do we have the optimal crop mix? Do we have the optimal land use pattern in the large tracts of the country which are currently plantation? Can we do better in terms of the crop mix and the way we are using the land? Um, Cultivation of better crop varieties and professional plantation management systems would be beneficial to adopt correct agro-management practices, bringing up the overall productivity of small holdings. Further, introduction of productivity-based incentive systems for plantation management would be beneficial to motivate them. And another factor is the adoption of suitable insurance schemes. Uh, it could be a solution for uncertainty in prices and this would provide a stronger incentive for companies to invest in the plantation sector. While tea, rubber, and coconut have been given much emphasis during the last few decades, it's timely to bring in an advanced environmental management plan for the plantation sector. And uh, the cultivation of crops such as palm oil should be allowed in identified areas uh, through a strategic environment assessment study to ensure those cultivations will not be done in fragile and environmentally unsuitable land areas. Now, finally, plantations have played a very central and crucial role in the economy of the country for over 150 years. They continue to be a very important asset even today. However, we should look for ways and means of providing greater momentum to fresh thinking and innovation. The NIPM is playing an important catalytic role in creating the skill base to lead such a process. The NIPM should be commended for its work. Those of you who have won awards today will be better placed to assist in striving towards a modernized plantation sector which is characterized by innovation and higher productivity, which achieves higher value production and decent jobs as well as new markets. Thank you very much. <laughs>